Beetle Ring had the reputation of being the toughest lumber camp on the river. The boys were certainly rough and rather hard drinkers, but their hearts were in the right place after all. Six months of idleness following a long run of fever, a lost position, and consequent discouragement had brought poverty and wretchedness to Joe Bennett. The lumber camp on the Featherstone, where he had been at work, had broken up and gone, and an old shack deserted by some hunter and now standing alone in the great woods was the only home he could provide for his little family. It had answered its purpose as a makeshift in the warm weather, but now, in late November, with the terrible northern winter coming swiftly on, it was small wonder the young lumberman had been discouraged as he tried to forecast the future. His strength returned, however, and lately something of his courage, for he had found work. It was fifteen miles away, to be sure, and in Beetle Ring Lumber Camp, the camp that bore the reputation of being the roughest on the Featherstone, but it was work. He was earning something, and might hope soon to move his family into a habitable house and civilization. But his position at Beetle Ring was not an enviable one. The men took scant pains to conceal their dislike for the young fellow who steadfastly refused to chip in when the camp jug was sent to Skylark, the nearest saloon some miles down the river, and who invariably declined to join in on the camp's numerous sprees. But Bennett worked on quietly. And in the meantime, to the old shack in the woods the baby had come, in the bleak November weather. Night was settling down over the woods. An old half-breed woman was tending the fire in one room of the shack, and on the wretched bed lay a fair-faced woman, the young wife and mother, who looked wistfully out at the bleak woods, white with the first snow, then turned her wan, pale face toward the tiny bundle at her side. "'Your pappy come tonight, baby,' she said softly. "'It's Saturday, and your pappy will come tonight, sure.' She drew the covers more closely and tucked them carefully around the small figure. Mend the fire, Lisette, please. It's cold. And, Lisette, please watch out down the road. Sometimes Joe comes early Saturdays. The old woman shook her head and muttered over the little pile of wood, but she fed the fire and then turned and looked down the long white trail. No Joe yet, she said, with a sympathetic glance toward the bed. She looked at the thick gray clouds and added, Heap snow soon. But the night came down and the evening passed while the women waited anxiously. It was near midnight when the wife's face lighted up suddenly at a sound outside, and directly there was a pounding, uncertain step on the threshold. The door opened and Bennett came in clumsily. The little woman's glad cry of welcome was changed to one of apprehension at her husband's appearance. The resolute swing and bearing of the lumberman that had returned as he regained his strength, were gone. He clumped across the room unsteadily on a pair of rude crutches, his left foot swathed in bandages, a big, ungainly bundle. "'What is it, Joe?' the wife asked anxiously. "'Just more my precious luck, that's all, Nanny.' He threw off the old box coat and heavy cap, brushed the melting snow from his hair and beard, and without waiting to warm his chilled hands at the fire, hobbled to the bed and bent over the woman in the tiny bundle. "'Are you all right, Nan?' he asked anxiously. "'All right, Joe, but I've been so worried.' "'And the baby, Nan?' The wife gently pushed back the covers and proudly brought to view a tiny pink and puckered face. "'Fine, Joe. She's just as fine, isn't she?' A proud, happy light flickered for a moment in the man's eyes as he stooped to kiss the tiny face. Then he shut his teeth hard and swallowed suddenly. "'What is it, Joe?' his wife asked, looking at the rudely bandaged foot. "'Cut it, nigh half off, and hurt the bone. It'll be weeks before I can do a stroke of work again. It means—I don't know what, but I daren't think, Nanny. The cook sewed it up.' He glowered at the injured member savagely. His wife's face grew paler still, but she only asked tenderly, "'How did you ever get here, Joe?' "'Rode one of Pa's Bream's horses, his red roan.' Fifteen miles on horseback with that foot? I should have thought it would have killed you, Joe.' 
"'I had to come, Nan,' said the lumberman. "'I didn't know how you were getting on, and I had to come. "'I didn't suppose they'd let you have a horse, any of them, now slayings come.' "'They wouldn't, if I'd asked them. "'They don't seem to like me very well, and I didn't ask.' His wife's big, wistful eyes were turned upon him in quick alarm. "'I'm scared, Joe, if you took a horse without asking. What'll they think? Where is it, Joe?' "'I had to come, Nan. I just had to.' But the woman was only half reassured. "'There, there, Nan,' broke in her husband. "'Don't be crossing bridges. Pete'll take the horse back. I've done the fellow lots of favors, and he won't go back on me. "'Don't worry, girl.' He moved the bandaged foot and winced, but not from pain of the wound. The hard look grew deeper on his face. "'I'm down on my luck, Nan,' he said hopelessly. "'There's no use trying. "'Everything's against me, everything. "'Following me like grim death, and grim death,' he jerked the words out harshly, "'is like to be the end of it, here in this old shack that's not fit to winter hogs in, let alone humans.' There's not wood enough to cut up to last a week. You'll freeze, Nan, you and the baby, and I'm just nothing. He took two silver dollars from his pocket and said, almost savagely, That's what we've got to winter on, and me crippled. But his wife put her hand on his softly. Don't you give up so, Joe, she said, and presently she added, Next Thursday's Thanksgiving. We've seen hard times, and we may see harder. But I never knew Thanksgiving to come yet without something to be thankful for. Never. Outside the storm continued, fine snow sifting down rapidly. Skid Thompson stopped with the big measure of feed he, which he was carrying. No, I've seen no ghost, said Bream slowly, still staring. Look here, Skid. Thompson looked into the stall and nearly dropped the measure. "'By George, Pose!' he said. "'By George!' The news flew over the camp like wildfire. "'Skipped!' said Bill Bates, sententiously, after a quick search had been made. "'It's all plain enough now. I never liked the close-fisted critter.' "'Nor I either,' growled Skid. "'Never chipped in with the boys, but was laying low just the same.' "'You won't catch him either,' said Bates. "'They're sharp, that kind.' The critter knew twould snow and hide his tracks. And I just sewed up his blamed foot, muttered the cook in disgust. Maybe we'll catch him. Up to Fat Pine two years ago, began Bream reminiscently. Big Donovan had stole a horse. They caught the fella. Yeah, I remember, said Skid Thompson. I was there. We caught him up north. The men nodded understandingly and approvingly. With a hundred and fifty dollars, the roan was, said Bream. Beetle Ring Camp passed an uneasy day, the jug for once receiving scant attention. Late in the afternoon, Trapper John, an old half-breed who hunted and trapped about the woods, stopped at the camp to get warm. "'Didn't see anybody with a horse last night or this morning, eh, John?' asked Posey Bream. "'Um, yes,' responded the old trapper quickly. "'Saw him horse last night. Man ride.' Big foot, so... Old John held out his arms in exaggerated illustration. Beetle Ring rose to its feet as one man. What color was the horse, John? asked Bream softly. Huh? Can't see good after dark, but think, um, roan. Bream looked slowly round the silent camp, and Beetle Ring grimly made ready for business. It was evening when the men stopped a few roads below the shack. A light shone out from a window, lighting up a little space in the somber woods. "'The fellow's got pals, probably,' said Posey Bream. "'You wait here while I do a little scouting.' Bream crept cautiously into the circle of light and, glancing through the uncurtained window, saw his man with his pals. He saw upon the miserable bed a woman with a thin, pale face and sad, wistful eyes, eyes that yet lighted up a beautiful pride as they rested upon the man who sat close by holding a tiny bundle in his arms. The man shifted his position a little so that the light fell upon the bundle, and then the watcher outside saw the sleeping face of a baby. There was rumor in the camp that Posey Bream had not always been the man that he was. 
that a woman had once blessed his life. But since they had carried the young mother away with her dead baby on her breast, to place the two in one deep grave together, he had gone steadily downward. With hungry eyes, Bream gazed at the scene in the poor little house, his thoughts flying backward over the years. A sudden, sharp, impatient whistle roused him, and he strode hastily back to the waiting men. "'Well, Pose?' interrogated Skid impatiently. "'He's there, all right,' said Bream in a peculiar tone. "'I ain't over much given to advising prowling round folks' houses, but you fellows just look in yonder.' He jerked his head toward the shack. "'I'm going to try for help, Nan. We're out of nigh everything, and my foot no better.' You can't do it, Joe. You, you'll die if you try, Joe, alone in the woods. Oh, Joe. The look of hope that had never wholly left the woman's eyes was slowly fading out. Well, I'll die if I don't try, Nanny. I'm... Huh, suddenly exclaimed the old woman, peering out of the little window. Bennett turned hastily and saw a long line of stalwart men and sturdy horses threshing resolutely through the deep snow and heading directly for the shack. "'Burn the hoss,' said Bream explosively. "'That's all right. Shake, pard.' He held out a brawny hand. Bennett shook, wonderingly. "'Pard the boys over at Beetle Ring heard, as you might say, accidental,' Bream coughed into his big hand, "'about your folks over here, and your wife, and the baby. They were powerful interested, especially about the baby. Why, pard, some of the boys ain't seen a baby in ten years, and we thought, as you belong to the camp, maybe you and your wife would allow that the camp had a sort of claim on the little critter yonder. He eyed the tiny bundle wistfully. And another thing that hit the boys, pard, he went on. Up at Fat Pine, they got what they call a mascot, being a tame bar, and up at Horseshoe, they got a mascot, being a goat. Lots of camps have them, fetches luck. At the close of the day, an anxious consultation took place in the big main room of Beetle Ring, and presently two men appeared outside. Right is right, Pose, said Joe Bennett. Wife all right? Bream turned toward the bed, and Mrs. Bennett smiled up at him with happy eyes and a bit of color already showing in her pale face. The boys, pard, are anxious about the little critter. They're kind of hankering, pard, and mum, if you're willing, and ain't afraid to trust her with us, why, we'd be mighty glad to tote her, just for a few minutes, over to camp. The boys are stiddy, all of em stiddy as churches, and... Hain't soaked to mite today, eh, mum, and they ain't going to. They've hove the jug into a snowdrift, and they'd take it kind, mum, if you were willing. The woman, still smiling happily, was already wrapping up the baby. Bream held up a warning finger when he returned a little later, and again smiled delightedly. Went to sleep a totin, if you'll believe it, that burned little critter, he said softly. And, he added, the boys, pard, are mighty pleased. And, mum, they thank you kindly. They say, the boys do, there ain't such a mascot as theirs in five hundred miles. They see luck coming, chunks of it, pard, already. And the big fellow went out and closed the door gently. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.